today. So essentially what's going to be the rundown for today is we're going to introduce all our four panelists and then we're going to have our uh, panel discussion with, in which a lot of the questions are actually from you guys. Um, so thank you so much for asking. And then we're going to go into our Q&A. So let's just get right into it. So um, first, why don't we have all our panelists just quickly introduce themselves so we get to know them a bit better. Um, let's start with Kevin. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, so yeah, guys, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm going to a second year in MedSci at Western. And just uh, some really quick stuff about uh, what I've been doing for the past uh, year. Um, so in terms of extracurriculars, um, I've been on the uh, Western University fencing team. I've uh, been with the Science Students Council of MedLife and Foot Patrol. And um, just uh, some stuff about what I really like, uh, music, um, classical music. I know a lot of people don't like classical music, but for some reason I really like it. Um, education, uh, I've worked as a student trustee in the past and I think that it, it's really helped me um, get a big grasp as um, a passion because I think that everyone should have uh, a good education. And finally, Sherlock Holmes, uh, whether it be the novel, the novels, I should say, or the uh, TV series, like the one with Ben Cumberbatch. But yeah, that's who I am. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today, Kevin. Um, next, we have Zuhair. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi, guys. My name is Zuhair. I'm an incoming uh, HBA1 student at Ivy. Uh, I was pretty involved my first couple of years at Western. I was actually in BMOS, which is Management and Organizational Studies, uh, with an honors spec in accounting. Uh, in my first couple of years, I was a research analyst on IBR, which is Canada's largest uh, undergraduate business strategy publication. And in my second year, I took on a VP role on PBSN, which was um, what, which was and currently is uh, Western's largest business club. Uh, I'm a, I was also VP of communications on the Ivy FinTech Club. Uh, in terms of summers, my first couple of summers um, in 2019, I had the pretty exciting opportunity to work in Ottawa for... Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's administration as a strategic research intern uh, and this summer I am working at Bank of Montreal in their corporate finance and uh, risk management practice so pretty exciting stuff and uh, glad to answer any questions you guys have today. Awesome thank you so much to see here. Next we have Amal. Thanks, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. My name is Amal Kayum, and I'm an incoming second year student at Western. I'm studying international relations, which is a very, very small program. Um, it differs how many students there are year to year. Um, I know myself when I came in, it was difficult for me to find people in my program, which, and we'll talk about a little bit later in the panel, um, having mentors really helps because a lot of my mentors are students who took IR. Um, I was seeing in the comments, some people want to go into IR, so I'm happy to talk a lot about that. Love my program. Um, I'm currently working at Spark Niagara, which is an incubator, um, and we and we are currently focusing on yes, uh, developing new companies, but how to make sure that they can survive starting up during a pandemic. Not because not only are they continuing, they actually have to start their operations, um, and so that's been very very interesting. It's a very hands on on job, so I'm really loving it. Um, I was also on PBSN in my first year, and I'm currently serving as a director of logistics for the Student Trustees Association, um, as I was a student trustee myself. That's actually how Kevin and I know each other. Um, for fun, I love anything to do with politics. Um, I'm a huge workout fan. I actually taught myself how to kickbox during quarantine, which has been a lot of fun. Um, oh, and, I'm, <laughs> and I also am very interested in working with various nonprofits. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amal. And last but not least, we have Adam. All right, thanks so much, Caitlin. Uh, hey, everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name's Adam, I'm an incoming HBA1, so very similar to Zuhair. Um, some of my extracurriculars in the past, um, I was on my program student association as the director of faculty relations, which was a ton of fun. And also this past year, I was a social science soft orientation leader. Um, as a matter of fact, Amal was one of my students and uh, in first year, I was a member of Foot Patrol, so that's kind of a little bit of what I was involved in in the past two years. And some of my interests uh, when it comes to work is nonprofit and social impact type of enterprises, and uh, I'm super passionate about music, and um, yeah, I've been trying to brush up on my instrument skills this quarantine and keeping it going. Awesome. Okay. Thank you guys so much for the introduction. Super um, involved, super successful uh, group of students. We're so excited to hear from all of you. So um, just a quick note before we dive into the questions and the actual panel, 
we do have our directors taking notes. So don't worry about taking notes, just kick back, relax, really try to absorb and listen um, to all the panelists share, uh, speak about their experiences. Um, we will send the summary notes as well as the recording of this webinar to all of you um, in an email later on. So yes, let's just get started. <laughs> so let's start with community and diversity. So I think a big question that a lot of people have, especially while choosing university as well, um, is there a strong sense of community and diversity at Western? And sort of what's the culture like? So I'm going to direct this question to mainly Zuhair and Adam. So if one of you guys would like to start, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. I can definitely speak on that a little bit. Um, in grade 12, personally, I had pretty much no idea where I wanted to go uh, for university. I actually applied to, I think, seven schools. And um, I saw a few of them. But something that kind of stuck out about Western to me was just that sense of community. Um, even though the campus is very large and there are a lot of students that go there, I was instantly kind of attracted to the sense of community that was there. Um, even just going through residences and seeing people and how close people in res and on their floors were um, was something that really, really kind of drew me to Western. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and really similar to Adam, I applied to a lot of universities uh, when I was in grade 12. And I think one of the things that really stood out to me uh, was it ultimately came down to a pretty binary decision. Should I uh, you know, go to a commuter school or should I go to uh, a school that's pretty isolated in the city of London, Ontario, right? So you can't go back home. Like I, I go back home like every couple of weeks, right? So I, I think being part of a school that's not a commuter school really builds that sense of you know community because everyone's sort of in the same boat. You just have to make new friends. Uh, in my case, I only knew two people from high school going to Western. So it really pushed me out of my comfort zone. Uh, especially when you're living in, in res, I think you're just sort of put in that incubator environment to make friends and ultimately, you know, pick like maybe five or six close friends that will maybe be your roommates or uh, pretty close friends going to your second, third and fourth year. So I would say, yeah, there's pretty good diversity at Western uh, and sense of community is, is just sort of fostered by uh, living in res in your first year and, and really taking all that experience uh, has to offer. Awesome. That sounds really great. And um, yeah, I, even like as a Western student myself, I can definitely attest to like the strong sense of community, the diversity, um, and just how, how nice and how willing people are to uh, help give you a helping hand and everything. So definitely um, it's all there. So um, next we're just going to move into residence life. Um, just to speak a bit about the unique differences uh, at Western. So what residence did you live in and how was your experience like? So um, we'll start with Kevin and then we'll go on to Zuhair. Yeah, for sure. So um, so first year I lived in Ontario Hall. Um, totally not biased, but like it's the best, it's the best residence. The food's great. The, um, <laughs> it's the newest building. Uh, I'm pretty, uh, and the, like you get to meet a lot of people because it, like a lot of people who go um, who live in Ontario Hall, I think it's just my year, I don't know about previous years, but everyone who lives there is wanting to be our friend. They want to talk to um, everyone who lives on their floor and or in the same building. So personally, um, the floor I had, uh, there were great people. They studied when we had to study, we partied when we had to party. And I think that like, um, personally, like the residents uh, plays a really big part in uh, your uni life because um, obviously these are the first people you will meet and you also go you're also going to be living with them for a very very long time so um, it to be honest it makes or makes or breaks your experience I'm not saying it's going to be bad but I'm saying that normally it's it always makes the experience so much uh, better and yeah and um, I'd say that like in terms of Ontario Hall uh, one of the, some of the perks I'd say so food and the rooms are spacious. But yeah, that's basically it. Awesome. And Zahir? Yeah, I gotta tell you, Kevin's a lucky guy for being in Old Hall. They have amazing <laughs> food. They really do. I, I wasn't hurt. So we, what we used to do is I, I used to have a group of friends uh, and we used to uh, make a weekly trip to Ontario Hall to get some of their uh, snack bar food. So for some context, snack bar is what I think you get either after 9.30 or 10.30 p.m. So it's like late night food. And their snack bar food, I kid you not, was almost better than our dinner. Not to say our dinner wasn't good, it was pretty decent, but Ohal is just known for being like the best out there in terms of food options. Uh, so yeah, definitely a lucky guy. In terms of Perth, uh, so Perth and Ohal are like right next to each other. And um, 
Perth is the smallest res uh, at Western, so I think there is a benefit to that in, in terms of the community that you get. It's, it's a very small and, and close knit community, uh, at least on your floor, like almost everybody knows the other person. Uh, I personally really enjoyed my experience. Uh, for me, it really came down to, uh, you know, whether I should go to a one of those larger community style residences where like every room is a double room, uh, like Medsid or Saugeen. Uh, versus Perth and I chose to you know be in Perth because it was a little bit more of a quiet environment where you know I could have fun with my friends if I wanted but I could also study if, if, if that's what it came down to right so I think there was ultimately a pretty good trade-off there um, yeah. that's yeah I think I think that's pretty much uh, it from my end yeah mm -hmm. awesome and um, both of you guys have sort of mentioned uh, like based on the PowerPoint that Ontario Hall seems to be the best residence would you guys say or um, what would be your recommendations for students choosing their residence next year? Or like, so it's really funny. Um, they when I when I was at least when I was in my first year, they used to call Ontario uh, Ontario Hall AO Hall for some reason. I think the the ultimate reason you find that was like a lot of business kids gravitate towards Ontario Hall. Uh, that's just how it is almost every year, I assume. Uh, but yeah, Oha I'd say is definitely up there in terms of like the mix that you get. It's like. It, like it, it can be like pretty lively, but it can also be quiet at times. Uh, food's great. Uh, I, I would say O'Hall definitely tops um, or, or is, is among the top in, in terms of red structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, there's also one other thing that um, I forgot to mention uh, about Ontario Hall. It's also the farthest res away from from the uh, from uh, like the campus because Western is pretty sprawled out. It's not like you have people like everything was shoved into downtown Toronto. Like uh, personally, like. For med side, like a lot of the uh, classes are in like the really big lecture halls. Um, so, and the thing is, that, like a lot of the lecture halls are also on the other side of Western. So, um, it doesn't only apply to like med side, but a lot of other, um, well, basically all my friends, like they'd have to like either take the bus or they'd have to walk. Um, and sometimes uh, I, I really didn't like taking the bus because like you have to go on a schedule. So basically, like for me personally, like the biggest disadvantage is I'm basically just sprinting around every day, uh, not really not like speed walking. Like it, it really helps with the freshman fifteen, but like, uh, yeah, it's, it gets kind of tiring and repetitive at the end of the day when you have to uh, basically just be walking everywhere. But if walking is your, uh, uh, if you don't mind it, then Oha is pretty great. But there's a lot of other reses which are much closer to um, the main center of um, Western, such as Delaware, Saugeen. Uh, medicine so on and so forth yeah. mm -hmm. so it seems like it really depends on sort of like i guess what kind of style of residence like obviously some are more quiet some are more lively some are more you know social and everything um and also the distance to to campus because obviously like oh hall although it's great but like i also personally have experienced it's like pretty far and one of the farthest um from the main campus building so definitely these are things that you guys should all consider when choosing your residence um and maybe quickly just touch upon what was your transportation experience like um, at Western or actually in London in general? So um, in terms, so, so before I hit the transportation thing, uh, I think one really big pro to living in O'Hall or Perth Hall is that you're right next to Barakat Shawarma. Uh, it's, it's, it, that was my go-to food choice in my first year. Everyone knows this. Uh, and so when, when you're looking for that late night snack, like 1 a.m., you've just been studying the entire day or the entire evening or whatever, very cast the place you want to go, let me tell you that. Um, but yeah, transportation, it, I, I'm assuming it would be pretty similar for, uh, for, for Kevin and I, uh, at least in our first years, just because like Perth and Ontario Hall are like pretty close to each other. Uh, my second year, I was living obviously off campus, so uh, it was uh, a bus ride away or a 25 to 30 minute uh, walk, but I mean, not, not many people walk on a daily. Uh, so yeah, it was like a 10 to 15 minute bus ride. It can get a little tedious at times. Uh, I think especially during the winter, it's like December, you just have to go for a 10.30 class. Uh, and so you're just like, ah, like I, I really wish I was walking distance, but and that is obviously a trade-off a trade off you have to make in your second year uh, when you're deciding whether you want to stay on res, uh, like London Hall or Alumni Hall, uh, or you want to go off campus. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Kevin, do you have anything else to add? If not, we yeah, can... I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna add something. Um, in terms of like the transportation, like there is a London uh, trans London Transit Company. I think that's what I think that's what it's called LTC. Um, but like 
Uh, well, like in terms of like uh, rush hour, like basically like it's no different than like rush hour for your parents work or if you guys are working right now. So like basically in the morning, everyone's going to class and like after school, everyone's going home. So like you really have to like be early for the buses because like I remember like um, there's a bus stop right in front of O Hall and same thing for her at, at some point. Right. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. if you um. You you can't just uh you can't just like see the first bus and you're like oh I'm going to go going to that bus like the likelihood given that it's rush hour nine out of ten the bus is probably going to full and the bus is not even going to stop for for your stop so like you really have to be early so that you can catch a bus that um is actually empty for you and also like um personally I can't really comment on much in terms of delays because like I come from Milton and like Milton has a pretty bad transit system. So when I came to London, I was like, oh, this, this bus system is like the best. Like, I'm so grateful I went to London. And then all my friends from like North York, Mississauga, uh, Toronto, who like use the TTC or like my way, they're like, oh yeah, this, this is actually not that great. And that, so it really uh, comes down to uh, where you come from because personally, I thought it was pretty good, but a lot of my friends thought it wasn't that great. But at the end of the day, just take into uh, consideration that you're going to get delays, but that's how um, public transit in general uh, works. So just uh, yeah, make sure that you know, Sorry, Kevin. I, I just want to yeah, echo that point. Maybe that's a great point that there really is like rush hour traffic. Like that's a real thing, especially in the in the afternoon times. So like I say, one thirty to like three. Like everyone's just coming back from their classes, and there have been numerous instances where like there's just not space on a bus. So I just decide to go and like walk back. Personally, like I'm a huge fan of walking. I, I like the, the view of the Western campus is pretty good. You see that that beautiful Ivy Building and and Weldon and everything. So like it works out well, especially in the fall. So I, it's not like like a do or die kind of situation, but uh, if you really, really want to be strategic about it, maybe try to plan your classes in a way that uh, they don't fall within rush hour. But that I, I would say is like a very kind of last resort kind of uh, scenario to take. Awesome. And okay. If I could just add in very, very quickly. Yeah, for sure. Um, sure I lived in Essex, so another South Side residence, and uh, I do enjoy walking, but I hate the cold. So during the winter, um, Western actually has a system of tunnels that run underneath it. Uh, they're not too many, but enough for me to kind of get into areas that I needed to go. So I would really recommend once you come onto campus, just kind of ask about them or either check them out um, because they were a great help to me. Yeah, awesome points, guys. Definitely um, very helpful tips in terms of transportation and getting around um, campus. So thank you so much. Now we're going to move on to extracurricular sports and clubs. So I think this is something I'm sure all of you guys can speak to. Um, so basically like what was what's your take on club community and the variety at western um, any personal stories or experiences you'd like to share um, and also if like for you guys uh do you have any club recommendations for first years based on um, certain programs or career interests so why don't we start with amal for sure so with western being such a big school a huge perk of going to a big school with that many students is there's hundreds or seems like hundreds and hundreds of clubs um, and if there isn't you can always create your own and it's a pretty easy process to do that um, for me personally i always like to try new things as i'm transitioning through life so as i came into university i knew i wanted to get involved in business hence i joined uh, the pre-business students network where i actually met that's how i met zuhair caitlin and i've met quite a few other friends and that club for me was a huge uh, networking opportunity in terms of making friends and finding even mentors, um, which was huge. I would highly recommend join the association or the club relating to your program. So for me, if I'm in international relations, there's an association of international relations. Join that club because it's so nice to meet like-minded people and they'll hold events like um, they had a like the association of IR had a debate night on Trump's presidency which is like how many people can I really do that with all my IR friends so you go and you get grab pizza and you debate those fun things so I really recommend look for the clubs that are associated with your program and your faculty but also and especially in first year um, and i wish i did this more use it as an opportunity to try new things there's a club at western called the purple yogis and they do yoga and it's like a drop-in yoga thing every wednesday i love yoga and i have never been and that's on my to-do list to hopefully do next year so there's all those types of clubs so definitely use it as an opportunity to go um and try new things um, and I'd also say when joining clubs try to figure out how many clubs because 
definitely you want to be, I, I find it's better to be more involved in a few clubs than barely involved in many clubs. And so I would really recommend, and you also keep in mind, with a club, you can be a VP or a director, or you can be a general member, which there's nothing wrong with either or. It's just about what you want to get out of the club. So as you're, so at Western, we have Clubs Week, where you can go and learn about all the different clubs, and you can talk to the club execs and find out about them. As you're doing your research onto what the clubs are about, figure out what you'd like to learn from that club, what you'd like to give back, and whether you can you would need a VP or director position, or you even want one of those, or can you join as a general member and just go to events and enjoy the perks? Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you so much, Amal. And maybe, Adam, do you wanna speak a bit as well? Yeah, definitely. So Amal pretty much uh, hit the nail on the head with that one. Uh, definitely go after things that you wanna try out something new. Um, and maybe stuff that you're even passionate about. So for me, one of my regrets was not joining the coffee club. I think that would have been a great chance for me to explore my passion for coffee. So just things that you're interested in, there's always a club that's open. And again, if it isn't, uh, it's a pretty simple process to go ahead and create. Um, in addition to that, um, again, in, in the strain of trying new things, um, I was never really involved in student governance in high school. Um, but come second year, I decided maybe I just want to see a little bit about what the student uh, council is like for social science. So I just joined as a general member and I learned a lot and I met a lot of great people. So don't be afraid to put yourself out there and try out things, even if you don't have a ton of experience. Awesome. And, and then maybe Kevin can share and then we'll wrap up this section with Suhara's experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, like basically like Adam and Mal said everything, but like, um, like personally, like uh, it, it really gives you the opportunity to do things that you couldn't have done in the past, but you wish you could have done. And now you have the opportunity. Like, for example, like um, uh, uh, with the Science Council, like I wasn't really on my um, school's um, student governance. So like I, I was like really excited to join the, um, the Science Students Council because um, definitely like I, I really like the student governance as student trustee um, in the past. But like the fact that I can actually like impact more people continuously past high school was definitely um, something I was really proud of. But um, also like the things that like um, Western's a really big school, right? So it's not like you're going to meet everyone within arm's reach that represents every single program, right? So uh, clubs are a great way to meet different people. So like I, I never realized I'd meet people from um, like music because like some people like my floor was like mainly like pretty homogenous in terms of the programs so like if it weren't for clubs I probably wouldn't have met people from different programs and um, different backgrounds per se and it really gives a great opportunity to just to get to know who they are their their um, experiences and it, it helps uh, yourself get inspired to do something greater so yeah Awesome. And Zuhair, do you want to add anything else, perhaps share some personal experience? Yeah, um, for sure, Dylan. I, I think uh, when, when, I, when I was personally in high school, I was um, student body president. So uh, being on student council was actually a pretty busy kind of endeavor for me during my high school years. Uh, pretty busy job. So I wasn't really able to do many more extracurriculars. One of the things I always wanted to do was work on a student publication and see how that experience is uh, from beginning to finish. So I decided to uh, join the Ivy Business Review had a pretty good experience there, it was, a, it was a good time, learned a lot, uh, and then leveraged that experience to secure my VP role on uh, the Pre-Business and Students Network. Uh, one of the things I think is that is pretty under sort of valued in, in the whole club landscape is assessing the cultural fit between you and that club. Every club has its unique culture. And I think that's very important for incoming first years uh, to understand, like just speaking from the business landscape, you have Western Investment Club, you have the Pre-Business Students Network, Western Founders Network, uh, W5, which is an entrepreneurship club, uh, and, and, and a couple others. But I think uh, the best way you can really assess a culture of a club is by chatting with the VPs, like the vice presidents and directors, uh, understanding who they are as a person, whether you'd like to work on their portfolio, and then ultimately applying. So sort of treat, like if you're looking for a director position your first year, definitely treat club recruitment very similar to uh, just like recruiting for a job, like understand that while they're also seeing whether you'd be a good fit, you also want to see it. is this somewhere I'd like to work for the rest of uh, my first year or even more than that. Uh, because ultimately it, it could end up being a pretty uh, rewarding decision for you, right? Maybe you start off as director, then you become vice president your second year, and then you end up leading that club in your third or fourth year. 
Uh, so definitely take a few weeks and it, as soon as university starts uh, to research what clubs are interesting and, and which ones you'd like to join uh, and then which ones you'd like to recruit for uh, for any given position. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. And for sure, like I am sure if any of you have any questions about certain clubs on campus, um, definitely reach out to any of these panelists. Uh, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to, to chat as well as um, just looking at, you know, LinkedIn or like different Facebook groups. Um, there's always postings about various clubs and such. So um, awesome. Let's move on to AEO and Ivy. So that's a very big pull for a lot of students um, coming to Western, I'm sure. So um, let's start with Kevin and Amal, who, um, you know, they, they, they do have AEO status. So what was your experience like maintaining and being AEO one this past year? Was it very stressful? Um, and then we can go into Adam and Zuhair to talk a bit about, you know, the application process and getting into Ivy. So let's start with Amal and Kevin. Amal, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Sure. Um, I think I personally stressed more than I should have heading into first year. Um, Adam, like you said, he was myself and I'm sure heard some of my rants and some of my stress talks, um, which I'm still very appreciative of. Um, but I definitely, I was very stressed out about that, of how does one keep an 80 average? That's impossible. What are you talking about? And what you, and just for context, AEO is Advanced Entry Opportunity to the Ivy Business School. You can apply to it from high school um, to start Ivy in 30 year. I just thought that was a question. Um, but in terms of the experience, don't freak out about your grades. Always keep a pulse on them. It's always good to keep an eye on where your grades are heading. But keep in mind, or for me personally, I did much better second semester than I did first. My grades picked up substantially and my second semester of university and all of first semester I freaked out for no reason. And when I calculated my average at the end of first year, I did fine. I, the big thing I think for a lot of students, especially those who get AEO, you're used to being very high achieving students in high school. I get it. You're not going to pull a 95 average in university. If you do, please call me and tutor me because I need that help. <laughs> um, but you're just not going to. I was someone who had a very high 90s average in university and worked my butt off for an 80 this year. And you just have to at a certain point be okay with that. You have. I talked to a prof once I got a bad grade and he was like, you can't cry over this because you're just going to make it worse for yourself in the future. Pick up, finding out a bad grade, continue. So I think the whole thing of grades is don't freak out. Your grades end up going higher. All of my mentors are telling me grades go even higher in second year, because for me, my breath C courses were my lowest grades. So I'm not taking those next year. So my average should be higher, um, you know, statistically speaking. So I look forward to that. Um, and in terms of the ECs part of it, with Ivy, and again, I've talked to a lot of people who are in Ivy now who are in their second year, it's a lot more about quality, not quantity. Um, Ivy actually, especially for your AE01 AE report, which you have to just submit a very short, no stress report at the end of first year, um, which lists what your extracurricular opportunities were. They only ask for three extracurricular opportunities and about three bullet points for each. So if you did eight, awesome, that's great for you. But Again, because they're not looking for quantity, they want quality in your leadership activities. And they also understand that, you know, doing eight ECs at say VP or president levels is hard then to keep up that 80 average that they're expecting. So be honest with yourself. It's okay if your grades fall, just pick back up. Um, and I think especially with AEO one, you're going to be okay. I wish someone said that to me a little bit more when I entered and they did once I got to Western, but you're like, do not freak out because you're just going to make it this unhealthy obsession, which I did for my, I had a spreadsheet where I calculated my grade every time I got a grade back. Like, don't, don't do that. Right? Um, so you're going to be okay. Thank you very much, Jamal. And Kevin, do you just want to, you know, give a yeah, bit sure. of your perspective yeah. as well? So like basically like um, Amal basically did a very, very uh, good explanation of everything. So like basically like the, the one thing they should take away from uh, what Amal said is a uh, chill because like uh, you're going to come into you because like the thing is that like university is already a stressful, um, stressful place. Like we get it because we were all in your shoes at some point. So when you get in, you're, you're going to meet people who are very high overachievers. You're going to meet people who kind of, uh, uh, what's it called? Like, over exaggerate the um the dire situation they're gonna 
it's like almost like those people who who are like exaggerating the current um, coronavirus situation. Not saying that it's, it's nothing, but like based I'm just saying that like some people over exaggerate. So basically, the main name of the game is that you have to um, focus on yourself because there's a lot of there's been a lot of people who are going to be flexing their marks or something or their ECs. So it's um the thing is that you have to focus on yourself and focus on your own improvement because if you were better than where you were, let's say from September compared to April of the following year, then that's great. Then you've made lots of improvements because AO1 is all about finding, is all about, um, is all about like exploring your extracurricular, uh, extracurricular opportunities as well as maintain, maintaining um, the 80%. But Western isn't a school who, which, um, which what's it called? Like is really hard academically. I'm not saying that's an easy school, but I'm saying that like, as long as you add an effort, as long as you spend a good couple of hours each day uh, studying, um, making sure that you go to your PCs, uh, you're going to be great because um, it's not, it's not, there's nothing like that's like the system isn't rigged to make sure that you get, uh, that you don't get a high mark. As long as you add in the effort, as long as you know that at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, I did my best, then your results will come to you. So at the end of the day, just don't freak out and always try your best. Yeah, awesome. That does sound very good. And I think it's very reassuring um, to a lot of incoming AEO students uh, to Western as well. So um, now we're going to kind of fast forward. So we're going to take a look at, you know, Adam as well as Zuhair's experience now that they've been in AEO and then now they're, you know, are incoming HBA1 uh, students to Ivy. So the question is, how hard is it to maintain a over the two years um, to get into Ivy in terms of ECs and your grades, um, and just share a bit about your your experience. So let's start with Suhair. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say it's not difficult for sure. Uh, it's like if you already have a obviously I will preface this by saying every student is going to have a different experience. Every student has a different learning style, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I remember the the year the. The summer before I got to university, I was so scared about what AEO is and whether I'm going to be able to maintain it. There was this site, Yconic, and I just kept searching out Yconic, and it was all these like high achieving kids, just like, yeah, I had a 99 in high school, will I be able to get like a 95 in university? I'm just like, like what's going on here? Like, are these kids like all a bunch of geniuses? Um, so don't I try to distance yourself from all of that. Think about yourself. I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, there obviously will be competitions. There'll be people who are doing better. There'll be people who are doing slightly you know, not so better, um, but try to distance yourself away from that. In your first couple of years, really think about your own goals and understand that uh, you have to get that 80%. Um, how can you sort of tweak your study habits uh, to achieve that? Uh, well, a couple of things that I found that were pretty helpful for me was um, when I was in high school, I would often study for a test or a final exam like one or two days before. Uh, and for university, I would really have to take that delta and extend it by another two to three days. Um, so for any exam, for a midterm exam, for example, I'd study four to five days instead of one to two days. Uh, and this was like, this is really specific advice, but it worked very well for me uh, because it gave me that uh, the amount of time I really needed to understand the content because university material is a little bit more application based. So uh, really understanding that it, like it's definitely achievable. I think the stat that, that's being thrown around is 80% of AOs get into Ivy who want it. Um, so it's it's definitely very possible. In terms of extracurriculars, it's nothing like crazy. You just have to be actively involved in two to three clubs, I believe. Um, so don't just be a general member on two to three clubs. Like you have to have maybe some level of executive or like a meaningful involvement within a club. Uh, and then make sure you're listing that very honestly. Uh, I think one of the things that Ivy really mentions is that they don't really like anyone lying on their application. So if you're a VP, don't say you're a president. If, if you like organize 10 events, don't say you organize 15 events because Ivy does cross reference everything you say on your application with your um, sources and they will like check if you're being honest about it. Uh, but yeah, I think if I was to tell my grade 12 uh, self something, it would be that you, you'll, you'll make it, it'll be, it'll be okay. Just don't worry too much. And, focus on yourself as opposed to comparing yourself with the competition. Fantastic, Zuhair. I think that's something we all need to hear. Um, Adam, do you want to just speak a bit about your experience as well? Yeah, definitely. I can I can speak on that a bit. Um, similar to Zuhair and Amal, I had that experience. Kind of, I'm not receiving any feedback on how I'm doing yet, so I didn't know how hard should I be working. Am I, am I doing enough? Am I doing too much? And once I received that first exam back, it kind of reminded me like, okay, I'm on the right track, but
but there is room for improvement. And I think your first year is a great opportunity to not only embrace your learning style, but to also explore new learning styles. Um, and a way that I applied that was just within my first month of coming to Western, uh, there they offer it's I think it's called like learning skills workshops. Uh, it's basically just an hour presentation offered by Western that kind of prepares you how to take a multiple choice test, how to write an essay at a university level, just like really important concepts that I really didn't have that much exposure to. So just going to those was a great first step. Um, but moving into second year again, trying to find your learning style, what works best for you, and incorporating extracurriculars into that is just making sure that you're going after what you're passionate about, but you're not, again, spreading yourself too thin and you're setting yourself up to achieve the most you can. Uh, Caitlin, I think you're muted. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, can hear you now. Sorry, maybe my computer wasn't working. Sure, I can definitely talk about Ivy without AEO. I know some people who are actually have achieved um, getting into Ivy without AEO status. I think it's definitely manageable. As you see on the slide there, about a third of the class uh, doesn't have uh, entry opportunity when they're coming into Ivy. So as long as you're, again, showing that leadership character and you're exceeding the 80 average by a little bit to show kind of that exemplary type of character, um, it shouldn't be a problem at all. And yeah. I can talk about dual degree just super quickly. And again, just prefacing this by saying, I only finished first year, so I'm no means an expert. Definitely reach out to someone doing it for more information. But I've been actively talking to a lot of people pursuing dual degree options, mainly because I want to. Um, so I'm in international relations. I'm hoping to do a dual degree with IR and IV. Um, and the way just to keep in mind that works is, in your fourth and fifth year, you, you'll have to take a course overload. So you'll have to take 6.0 credits to graduate. Um, also with dual degree, at least for IR, I know for sure, you can't extend it. So you can't, so it's a five-year degree. You can't make it five years in an extra semester. Um, they won't let you. You have to stick to that five-year uh, timeline. Um, from the students I've talked to, it's very doable, especially because once you get to fourth and fifth year, you found your place, you found your footing, and so it's not too, too hard to take extra courses, and also you can always do them in the summer as well. I believe 20 or 25 percent of current Ivy students are dual degree students, um, and that's just a really, really great opportunity to get um, your expertise in business, but also a whole different area. I know that's why I'm doing it. I absolutely love IR. Um, and that's why I came to Western is because I get to do two things I love um, in a mesh degree and, and with respects to both without kind of giving up anything. So definitely recommend people look at dual degree options. It's on the Ivy website. They'll just be sure with all the different programs you can do a dual with. Um, I highly, everyone who's done it, I've heard good things. So I highly recommend looking into it a little bit. Uh, Caitlin, if you if you don't mind, I'll just add a quick point regarding um, dual degree. For some reason, I'm not able to hear you. Um, there might be something going on with Zoom, but um, but yeah. So just to uh, provide some insight in, into the dual degree, I think it's a very smart, like strategic choice. Um, from what I've uh, heard from dual degree students, like when it comes down to IB recruiting, it, their chances are pretty good for for landing a decent internship, just because they have two shots at recruiting as opposed to just one. Uh, so normally what you do is as soon as you get to Ivy, you start recruiting for your next summer 
uh, sort of internship for your next summer, uh, whereas dual degree students have uh, the opportunity to do it two times. So uh, maybe, you know, whatever mistakes they may make around in their first uh, recruiting effort, they can sort of mitigate those mistakes and learn from it and apply it uh, the second time around. Uh, and, and in terms of, I, I know there were a couple of questions uh, with how to get into IV without AEO. Uh, just like Adam, I've heard like a, I've heard of a lot of students being able to do it. Uh, it definitely is a little bit more work, just academically speaking, and extracurricular as well. Uh, I think the the cutoff in terms of marks is like four to five percent higher, but don't quote me on that. Uh, the the UW or Reddit is actually very useful for that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it's it, it's it's pretty it's pretty doable, but you just have to definitely work towards achieving a, a little bit higher of an average and maybe a few more extracurricular roles from a leadership perspective. Yeah, sure. I can definitely start talking about this stuff. Um, moving kind of chronologically, uh, after you accept your offer of admission, uh, depending on your academic average, you're going to receive a scholarship that ranges. Um, I think they kind of changed the structure of it this past year, um, but just make sure you check once you accept your offer. Um, moving past that, once you're in Western and once you're involved, um, what you want to do is be proactive. Um, one of the first things that I remember doing it's kind of getting myself familiar with the UWO student awards search. Um, I really recommend checking out that resource once you're on campus. Um, just a way to keep track of awards, see which ones are applicable to you and apply. You know, it doesn't hurt to apply and uh, you could really benefit from it. Another thing that I looked into was the USC awards and I was a recipient of the Future of Western Award, which is for a first year student. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking those out as well because, yeah, again, it doesn't hurt to apply at all and the benefit could be really great. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, please pardon the bad camera quality. I had to change up uh, my computer so I can hear everyone now. Um, this is the older one for sure. Uh, but yeah, in terms of scholarships, there's definitely a lot of opportunities out there. In my first year, I applied for the Dean's Undergraduate Scholarship in Social Science. Uh, so it's an opportunity offered to uh, students, obviously in the social science faculty, and I'm pretty sure the same applies for every other faculty out there. Obviously not the same scholarship, but like different kind of scholarships that cater to different students and in, uh, in various faculties. Uh, so it is the onus is on you, right, to do research because it is free money that's not taxed, so you got to do research for it. Um, so go on the website, try to find uh, some pretty good scholarships out there. Uh, if you were involved in your extracurricular community in, in high school, I'm pretty sure you should be able to get a few, uh, not only from university, but also from high school and like external uh, sources. I know once you get to Ivy, uh, just like Adam was talking about, they, you have a generic application that you fill out as part of your HBA application. Technically, it's optional, but with $30,000 tuition, I think everyone's going to apply for it. Um, but yeah, you just you just fill out that generic application. I think the top 15% of people end up getting it. Uh, I was fortunate enough to actually get one uh, late into the season uh, and it was called the Lori, uh, do not know how to pronounce the second and the third word, but it's, it's, a, it's the Lori scholarship, I like to call it, an HBA. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really your luck of the draw ultimately, just fill out the application, hope for the best. Uh, but one tip I would give is that don't just rely on those sources of, uh, uh, for, to, to finance your education, look for internships, they're great sources of money. Uh, that can help fund your ed education, then also look for external uh, scholarships uh, in between school years and also during every summer. Uh, especially if you're going to Ivy, it's going to be a, it's going to be a pretty expensive four years, so you want to get any cash you can.
Yeah, so um, basically, uh, Western has, um, I don't know, it's kind of similar to like Google Classroom or D2L, whatever uh, you guys use, but it's like an online classroom thing associated for each class. So OWL stands for Online Western Learning. It just coincidentally is called OWL, so yeah. Uh, so for uh, OWL, you have like an online forum, which uh, you basically can ask questions. Um, normally like PAs can answer it, the professor can answer it. But also there's lots of other um, forums that you can use. So there's Facebook groups. Um, you can find your own friends uh, and you guys can come together and make group chats yourself. They're all very good uh, resources when it comes to getting support, person-to-person uh, -person support. But obviously there's also, um, there's also like on, you can go online and find YouTube videos which are great. Um, and also there's like professor and PA hours. Um, it's kind of like, it's still kind of similar to how uh, office hours would work in um, if everything was in person. So basically like the professor uh, gets on some sort of online um, video call application um, at a certain time and then everyone just joins and asks the questions. So it's, it's still pretty similar to um, how, uh, you, how support would still work if everything was in person because everything here was online in the first place. And in terms of bird courses, um, or, or Amal, if you want to go into that, it's up to you. If you want to go ahead, go oh, for it. Right, sure, all right, cool. All right, so like bird courses, basically like, I, I, personally, I really don't know why they're called bird courses. I, it's, not, it's not like only called bird courses in the Western. I thought it's only called bird courses in the Western because we've got, got a lot of geese. But like, that's not the case because apparently my friends at Waterloo also call it birds. I actually but, thought the exact same thing. That's a very, yeah. very funny story. Yeah, because like, but honestly, like, it makes no sense because like, the geese are pretty aggressive. So I, I don't know why like aggressive birds are associated with hard courses. But anyways, um, basically, basically like uh, bird courses are like courses are, par are apparently really easy. So if you ever go on Reddit, if you're bored one day, and you go on Reddit and you see people like just asking uh, questions saying like, oh, what are some really bird courses so basically they're just asking like really easy questions uh e they're asking for what are some really easy courses so personally like um as a math science student i really don't have much many electives let alone some of my electives probably have to be used uh to pursue my uh, any specialization or modules i want to do so i can't really speak much but like on the one elective i actually do have it's um it, you kind of want to uh, balance it you some days you want to like have like a course which is easy so you can get high marks. A lot of people want to go for these bird courses. But the thing is that like, one thing that I realized and I see from my friends is that they go for what's easy but not necessarily what they're interested in. And the thing is that like, you see this on Reddit where people tell you not to bird courses unless you have a genuine interest in it. And then some of my friends would be like, oh, don't worry, I, I won't be those people. But then they turn out to be those people. They lose all interest and typically the bird course is their lowest mark so at the end of the day it's more important to choose courses based on genuine interest rather than if it's easy or not because like if you enjoy i don't know calculus let's say personally i don't enjoy it but congratulations if you do if you really enjoy calculus take it that might be considered a bird course for you but not bird for, for anyone else if you enjoy let's say, uh, I, I'm not quite sure if they offer music, uh, like piano, they, they probably do, but like take things that you have genuine interest in because at the end of the day, your interests will reflect in your grades. So yeah. I, I just want to echo that point. Um, if there's one point that you really want to take out of this panel for the Western University panel, is that don't take bird courses just for the sake of taking bird courses. I have a really, really fun story that I often tell my friends. Uh, many of them actually know it. Uh, but when I was in my first year, I took uh, the infamous comp side 1033, uh, which is actually a quote unquote bird course, but turned out to be my second lowest mark in all of university. Uh, just because I just don't really care about computer science too much, like I, I, many people do, it's just not my thing. I'm more of a politics slash business guy. Um, so when it came down to final exam season, I realized that I'd only been to two out of the 14 lectures in the entire semester. Uh, so I, I asked for, as asked around for some final exam notes which I think were 40 pages long. And me being, you know, the confident self I am, I was just like, yeah, 40 pages, that's easy. I just divided it up into hours. I was like, I can easily get this done in eight hours if I do five pages per hour. So I studied the night before my exam. Uh, so I was with my friends, uh, we were in this breakout room at, in, in Perth Hall and I started studying at six right after my other exam. And it was 10 o'clock 
uh, and I was only at page four out of 40. And my friends were just like, sure, how are you doing? I was like, I'm not doing too well, guys. Uh, and so my exam was 9 a.m. the next morning. Uh, so I literally did not sleep. I, and I, this is not by any means how university actually is. This is just me not choosing the right course. Um, my exam was 9 a.m. the next morning, stood, uh, stayed up until like 7. I asked my friend to uh, wake me up after I take a 35-minute power nap. Uh, took two espresso shots, went to that final exam, and literally was just a body standing or sitting there. Did not offer any value to that exam. Did not do justice to what comps I should have been. Um, so yeah, just my, my key takeaway after that for second year was I only took courses that I genuinely enjoyed. Uh, I took three, four business courses in my second year, five poli-sci courses. Uh, ended up uh, GPA-wise getting pretty similar marks, but the process is just way more rewarding when you're taking courses that you actually enjoy. So, uh, and, I, and I know it's easier said than done, right? Like when you're AEO's kids, especially, uh, you're the one big number that's going on in your mind is 80, 80, how am I gonna get 80? But believe, your, believe in your own abilities when you think about the fact that if you take something you enjoy, you will almost always get a higher mark than if you take what, for, you know, what, what, what I perceived as a very dry course. Uh, so yeah, that's just one pretty interesting story I wanted to tell. Yeah, like I had the exact same thing, right? Like I, everyone told me to take comp sci, I think it was 1032, like the business decision making. If, and for comp sci courses, just for reference here, you have to get a 49% on the exam to actually pass the course. If Corona did not happen and I had to do that exam in person, I was going to fail that course, be thrown out of my program and have to figure life out all over again. So don't listen to people when they say bird courses because that's not true. Also, just for clarification, they call it a bird course because you can fly through it um, in case oh, people get Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. So that's why it's, it's called- It's not geese. It's, it's not let, the geese. Let me tell you, I did not fly through comp side 10 degrees. <laughs> that's, that's one thing for sure. Yeah, so that's what's called the bird course. I won't spend too, too much more time on bird courses except for say, don't believe the word bird course. Um, but in terms of the online, uh, classes. One thing I would recommend because I took my comp sci class actually online and as much as I hated that class with everything, every fiber in my body, one thing I recommend and especially because of what next semester might look like is with a lot of online classes you won't have a lecture say Tuesday from x time to x time. As a result it's up to you to stay on top of your work. Don't trick yourself and tell you tell yourself that you'll just do it especially if it's a class you hate actually go into your day and schedule it in. I had a print out of my schedule and I put comp sci on Fridays like after my business class and I physically scheduled it in and I could make no excuse to not do that comp sci course. Highly recommend that. I'm doing that for my courses next year because that's what actually makes you sit down and do them other than or you end up and I totally would have just like so here as well going crap I went to two classes out of like the 40 this semester and I'm so screwed. Um, so that's my one tip. Yeah, just, just to kind of piggyback off that, I think the biggest sort of takeaway is that in your first year, don't sort of be like, like don't overestimate your capabilities like academically, like really understand what you're made out of and like what you can do. Um, there's a lot of things going on in your first year, like, like on all the courses, but also maintaining a social life, making friends, getting extracurriculars. It's all very doable, but you got to keep tabs of what's going on, right? So have a calendar, whatever works for you. For me, it was a calendar, uh, a physical and an online calendar that I just, had all my exams listed, all my interviews for extracurricular positions listed, and that really helped me navigate, you know, the entire first year uh, situation. Yeah, I can begin. Um, my experience at Western, there you have 
so many mentors as long as you reach out to them. I found at times where I had a question and I was going through my list of like 10 mentors I could reach out to. And I just at some point had to do any money mo and pick one. Um, sauce and I think I almost called you Thunder, see, because Adam was my soft and his soft name was Thunder. Um, like I, I think with your sauce, you have faculty sauce and red, red sauce. So faculty sauce are the people who are in your faculty. So with Adam, I know personally, when I first started taking business 1220, was super stressed, like most of the kids taking business 1220, because my balance sheets were not balancing, and I was going to cry, and we kidnapped Thunder and kept him in my room until he helped us balance our balance sheets, which I'm, again, super, super thankful for. So your faculty sauce are there for things like that. Um, my rest sauce, I always make the joke, they kept me alive. Um, and so those your softs are really good resources in terms of classwork, um, but also just life and helping you through things. LAMP specifically um, is Leadership Academic Mentorship Program. And so you can sign up for LAMP. If you go to Western's Academic Support and Engagement page, you can sign up for a LAMP mentor and you'll get paired with someone who's in your program. And if not your program, then at least your faculty. I know my LAMP mentor was the first person I met on campus that was in my program. And for me, that was super, super useful just because being from such a small program, I felt like there was no one else I could relate to and touching base with my LAMP mentor was so helpful. Um, so highly recommend people sign up for that. Um, Western Connect, if you go, it's just a website. They list actually, and Western runs a lot of workshops. Uh, Adam touched on that um, earlier there's workshops. I attended one on conflict management because I was working um, externally outside of Western with a team and I felt like I just need to uh, better my skills in conflict management. And as a result, I took that uh, workshop and I felt that I had, um, you know, gained some experiences and gained knowledge as a result. So always check out Western Connect and because they'll always have a list of internal and external workshops that they're running. And they also list sessions of when, let's say, KPMG is coming um, to Western for coffee chats or for networking events. So those are all people and then also um, avenues for you to look through for mentorship programs and internship uh, opportunities. Yeah, I think Amal was incredibly substantive covering those points. Uh, just to add a bit off for, for every point, I think for, for softs, like softs are pretty great people. There's like older versions of you and like pretty fun. Like they, they give you some pretty honest advice. It's not like filtered or anything. Like they tell you how it is. Um, and they're a good, incredibly good uh, resource, like emotionally as well. Uh, my, my roommate, uh, Outhouse, he was a soft at Soggy and he had a good time. Um, and the LAMP program is incredibly resourceful. Uh, my mentor, he used to provide me with like test banks for almost every course. Um, and that, those are really important, especially if you're in a test bank heavy course like economics. I don't know how it was for you guys and uh, Amal and Caitlin and, and, your, and, and Kevin your first year. Um, but for Adam and I's year, like econ was almost entirely test banks if you had Jeannie Shear or a couple other professors. So test banks are basically just like 40 pages per chapter, like questions that you could get on an exam. And like what they did for econ in my year was the exam was entirely those questions. That won't be for every course, uh, but if you do get a course in which that's the case, you can easily end up getting a 95 plus if you just memorize those questions. It was as simple as that. Uh, in fact, my, macroecon was my highest mark in university. So like, leverage your LAMP mentor for obviously like emotional support, like whatever like career support you need, but definitely get the banks. Um, they will automatically provide it to you, if, but, if, but if they don't, like definitely ask them, hey, do you guys have any like academic resources that I can leverage? Um, and to sort of touch upon that last point, Western Connect, uh, personally for finding my first and second year internships, like I sort of utilize like individual like grit a little bit more than like Western's on-campus recruiting resources. Uh, and I think that's pretty much like a very similar case for like most first year students, especially like in business, like it's, it's like it's relatively difficult to find an internship through Western Connect in your first year, like if you're looking for a business internship. So what you should normally do is like try to cold email people in the field that you're looking for uh, or looking for a job um, and, and sort of do that independent research as well, right? So Western Connect, while it may be good for some people, like it might not just get you the internship just by itself. You definitely have to put in that work by, by like independently as well. Um, clubs are a great resource for jobs. Uh, I think this is like 
pretty well known in, uh, among the Western community that Western Investment Club, Pre-Business Students Network, Western Founders Club have like really regular job postings. And that's super useful for, uh, for students that are looking for internships because they practically give you like steps on how to apply for a job. And if you're part of those clubs, you can just apply it and hopefully secure an interview or two. Yeah, I could go on and on about the orientation program. I think it's amazing. Um, basically, the balance between faculty and res softs is uh, really great because you kind of have resident softs who live in res with you. So they're kind of more of that emotional support. They're there for you whenever you may need them. Faculty softs, they'll come for floor meetings like I did. Um, I would just visit my frosh and kind of see how they're doing, check in on them, and focus more on those academic or faculty specific type of questions and needs that they would kind of asked me about. So yeah, definitely a great resource. And I would really recommend connecting with your softs, keeping in touch with them. And uh, yeah. Just one thing before we go into questions, I know there's a couple of people in the chat who are saying that they're also hoping to go into IR. Feel free to, if I didn't answer your question, I saw some of them come up, but I don't think I got to them. Just feel free to send me a message on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. I'm happy to chat more about the program. Yeah, and, and same thing here. Like I, I know there were a couple of people that, that texted me on, on my other laptop back when it was working um, and I was not able to reply to them. So feel free to reach me, reach out to me on, on Facebook or LinkedIn. I'd be uh, Glad to help in any way I can. I have friends at Huron specifically. I actually toured Huron when I was looking at Western, thinking of applying there. Um, each affiliate, or at least how I saw it, has almost like something special about them or something historic about them. So Huron historically was really focused on leadership. I believe Kings was Catholic and Brescia is still all girls. Um, each so if you want to do like religious studies, King's is the affiliate for that. Any religious studies courses are usually held at King's. Um, main campus students can take courses at affiliate colleges and vice versa. I just know if you're an affiliate college, you have to um, take a specific number of courses at your home uh, affiliate before you, or, you know, in addition to the main campus ones that you take. Um, there's obviously perks to both and downfalls to both with an affiliate you're it's a smaller community which I know is a perk if you're that's what you're looking for um you're still embedded into main campus so you're not really missing out on too much but again if you're on main campus or if you're an affiliate some students feel like they're not as part of main campus so it's totally up to you as to what you're looking for um definitely worth looking into I personally decided against it um I decided to come to western overall just because I had more friends going to western overall um but perks to both definitely just look into
we can talk a bit about that. Yeah. So in terms of research opportunities, um, in first year it's incredibly hard because um, the, the, the truth, the, the sad truth is that not many professors need first year um, uh, students for um, research because um, innately we don't have as much knowledge. Um, we don't have much experience using um, lab equipment. Uh, there's a, a very uh, intensive, not intensive, but like there's a very uh, good uh, second year labs course which basically gets you set up for um, for like a lot of lab procedures, how to use equipment, so on and so forth. And uh, a lot of uh, research opportunities require that type of um, knowledge. So unfortunately, not many professors are actively searching for, um, for uh, first year students. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't any, uh, po there isn't a possibility that you get a research position. I know some friends who do have um, research, research positions. Now, in order to get them, the main aim of the game is just to um, send cold, e cold emails. So similar to uh, recruiting uh, for, for internships, you just have to um, send cold emails to basically any professor you find interesting. Uh, so what I mean by interesting, I mean that you take a genuine interest in what they are um, doing in terms of the research. There's some professors who just really love doing, uh, really love um, talking about birds, uh, haha, bird courses. But there's also uh, some professors who really have this really, I don't know, you could say obscure interest, but they have a genuine passion for it. So you have to make sure that when you're reaching out to professors, you, uh, first of all, know how to send a great cold email and also take genuine interest in their, in their studies. Because I know a friend who um, got a research position and everyone was like, wow, like, like you're set for med school, but like little did he know he was just like dissecting fish for four months. So you have to make sure that you actually take a genuine interest in the, um, in the uh, research. So at the end of the day, finding a research opportunity is just like finding a job. You have to reach out to the professor or company if it's an internship and um, take a genuine in interest in what you'll be doing and what the professor does. And if you follow that, you'll be great. Uh, yeah, be I careful just, with that. One of my, I think it was my RA or my, one of my soft girlfriends was in a research thing where she was, they were like holding mice upside down by their tails. <laughs> I, I'm not a science kid. I don't know, but doesn't sound fun to me. Just quickly, I just wanted to address Carson's point, I believe, about um, achieving 85 plus in, in BMOS with like, I, Please, you said 25 hours of, of studying per week. Uh, I think that's a really, really good question. And I, and I say because uh, though that equation kind of thing is like something that I was thinking about as well before getting, getting my first year. And I know Maggie said that it's, it's dependent on every, like every person's study habits, which, in, which is entirely true, right? It, every single person's going to have a different way of approaching their exams. Uh, BMOS, like, definitely should be achievable. If you're putting 25 hours per week, you're a much better student in first year than I was. Um, but what I will say is um, that try to tweak around with your schedule as well. I, Caitlin knows the story from PBSN, but my schedule was just completely different from most people because most of my classes were in the afternoon. So what I do is instead of sleeping at like 12, I just like have a good time in the evening and then like study until it's like three or four and then wake up at 11. I still get my seven hours of sleep, but it's completely unorthodox to like most people. So I'm not recommending that by any means, but if that's what works for you, if you study better in the night when everyone's asleep and it's only you and the desk and, and your papers and your laptop, then you know you can go for that. You don't have to go for the, the, the best thing about university is the flexibility. If you're not, you're not in high school anymore, so your classes aren't gonna be like nine to like three, you can easily tweak around with your schedule and see what works best for you. So that's definitely something that I would like to sort of offer as like parting advice. Yeah, 